Well, I'm going to take a reading uh, from Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Matthew 4 and verse 12. The title of my Christmas Eve sermon, sermon is A New Dawn. Sounds like a Star Wars film, doesn't it? A New Dawn. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew often, uh, in, in his early passages, quotes from the Old Testament to explain the prophetic fulfillment of the Christmas story and the birth of Jesus. And uh, here, uh, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 9, and it's, it's quite important because If you notice, after the quote from Isaiah 9, it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, the kingdom of God, heaven is at hand. Then he goes and calls his disciples. So to Matthew, this prophecy explains the ministry of Jesus. Uh, He couldn't think of a better prophecy to use to explain what Jesus had come to do, what his mission was, what his call was, what his manifest festo was than Isaiah 9. And that's why we're going to be looking at that tonight. It's a little bit like Luke. I don't know if you know in Luke 4, uh, when Jesus is in the synagogue uh, in Nazareth and he opens it up and he says, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. The deaf will hear, the blind will see, good news to the, uh, good news to the poor and the favorable year of the Lord. You know that? So Luke is using that passage, Isaiah 61, because Luke thinks this is a great passage to explain the ministry of Jesus. So if you really want to know what Jesus has come to do, you could spend some time in Luke 4 and looking at Isaiah 61, or you can do what we're going to do this evening and look at Isaiah 9. In fact, let's do that. Let's, let's go and read Isaiah 9, chapter 1 and verse 7. And you'll recognize the quote from Matthew and some other uh, stuff here as well. Isaiah 9, verse 1. But there'll be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest. As men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders. The rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. One of the things to understand, if you really want to understand why Matthew and sometimes Luke quote from the Old Testament, don't just read the quote that we just read in Matthew. Go back and spend some time in the context of the original prophecy because that's what's in Matthew's mind. He's not just plucked that small scripture from Isaiah 9 out of nowhere and stuck it in. 
But when he put it in, he and every other Jew that would read his gospel would not just see the small section in Matthew 4, but they would immediately uh, think of the context of the original prophecy. And what was happening? Well, uh, what was happening here was, was a great move of God was coming to Israel after God had hidden his face for a long time. If we move back into chapter 8, I'll just read some scriptures for you. The situation is drastic. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, that was the first area that was carried off and destroyed by the Syrian Empire up there in the north. So they'd experienced tragedy. And there was only a remnant that had remained. Those that were hanging on to God and believing God. They were a believing remnant. A people of hope, even though they had traveled a very distressful path. Verse 16 of Isaiah 8, this is the chapter before the one that Matthew quoted, says this, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. I will even look eagerly for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me offer signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. You see, he was a remnant. When we talk about a remnant, what we're talking about, the ones that are left. All the others had been carried off or many of them had turned their backs on God and thought that God had, uh, had, had, had forgotten about them or didn't exist. But this remnant... This final remaining believing ones, you know there's always a remnant in the Bible? No matter what happens, there's always a remnant. No matter how difficult it gets, no matter how hard it gets to follow the Lord, there's always some that believe. Remember Elijah, and he thought that he was the last one? And there was the thousands more that were there. Always a remnant, believing, hoping, the seeds of the next new dawn or breakthrough. And so they'd been through a rough time, as I read, I will wait for the Lord who's hiding his face from the house of Jacob. They'd been through an era or a time where God just was not showing up. God was not answering prayer. God was not blessing them. And it seems that all of God's promises were just somehow hollow or echo, uh, an echo that, that didn't bring any reality into their lives. They read what God had promised. They read about his character, his loving, kind, forgiving nature, that he was a God of restoration. But their experience in this season was one that seemed to be the opposite. As I said, God was hiding his face from them. But what did they do? Many Christians, when things don't go according to the way that they think they should go, and when God doesn't do what they think God should do, uh, and he seems to be hiding his face from them, many Christians just back up and say, well, if you're not going to turn up for me, then that's it, I'm off. I don't want anything more to do with you. I'll just go my own way. But not this remnant. They understood that if God was hiding his face, that uh, they should seek him until he would show his face again. They waited for the Lord. They said, I will look eagerly for him. And there was something about that process of seeking God when he was silent, in the silent years, in the years of non-manifestation, in the years where God was not intervening. On the contrary, the enemy was intervening and God was not moving and God was not blessing and God was not opening his heaven. In those times of his hiding of his face, something very powerful was actually going on in their lives. How many of you know that God works as powerfully behind the scenes, silently, as he does when he performs great miracles and wonders? And sometimes as Pentecostals we forget this. Because if God hasn't given me a miracle recently, then uh, what's the matter with him? Uh, is he even there? But when God works in miracles, it's a wonderful thing when he intervenes. But just because God is not intervening at the present moment, say in some of our lives, does not mean that he's as powerfully at work as when that miracle comes. This is Christian maturity, friends. To trust God when we don't see what he's doing, believing that he's doing something for our best. That somehow he's working things silently, quietly, that we don't understand because there's an end result. 
Because we believe that God loves us and has a future and a hope for us. So when we can't see the future and hope is, is dying like a dim flame, we trust God, we believe God, we seek God. I wonder how many people never received from God because uh, they knocked once and they didn't keep knocking. I wonder how many people didn't find what God had in store for them because they sought him once, but they didn't keep seeking. I wonder how many people didn't receive that which God was planning to give them because they asked once, didn't get anything, and did not ask again. The whole of the Lord's Prayer in Luke's Gospel, it's there, the Lord's Prayer. Teach us to pray, Lord. You have the Lord's Prayer. Most Christians stop and think, well, there's, there's the teaching. God has taught us. He's given us the Lord's Prayer. But that's only the beginning. Because God knew that if he gave us the Lord's Prayer, the type of themes that we should pray through the Lord's Prayer, that that wouldn't be enough. Why? Because most of us would pray it once, look at our watch, say, what, you know, where's God? Thought he was powerful, and then not pray it again. So right after the Lord's Prayer is a whole section on pressing in. Seek and keep seeking. Ask and keep asking. Knock on the neighbour's door, even though they're annoyed and don't want to give you any bread. But they do. How much will, more will God give you bread? Uh, how much more will a, uh, a human being marred by sin uh, give bread and, and, and fish to their children uh, when they're hungry rather than a snake or a scorpion? And then it says, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So there's a persistence here. There's a, a period, <coughs> excuse me, there's a period of waiting, of frustration, of, of, of desiring, of hungering, of despairing. But these things are very precious because it's all part of the process. We're then to take those things and we're to take them to the Lord. This is what they did in chapter 8. Seeking God. Believing God. They believed that there was going to be a breakthrough. They believed this remnant. Nobody else did. They'd all give it up. But this remnant, this few believed that there was going to be a new dawn. They didn't give up. And in chapter 9, this is the new dawn that we see that Matthew quoted to talk about what Jesus' ministry was going to be, to be like. The people who walk in a great darkness will also see a great light. A new dawn was going to come. In Matthew's Gospel, we find that, that when John's ministry entered, he was a shining lamp. Jesus realised that now was his time, his moment to move into ministry. There is a moment for everything. Jesus, you know, he, he was alive for 30 years before he started his ministry. What was he doing all that time? We know very little. He was preparing himself. Who knows the prayers that he was praying to his fathers, the scriptures, during this time of preparation. But now the moment had come and he left Nazareth and went into a place that was frequented not just by Jews but Gentiles as a symbol that although he was going to focus on the Jews in his ministry, he had the whole world in his views. And when Acts of the Apostle came, that was when the ministry was going to be there and the gospel would be preached to everybody from whatever background or religion that they were formerly in. Now, the picture of a people sitting in darkness, seeing a great light, the shadow of, of darkness is very powerful. Why are they sitting in darkness? Have you ever been in darkness? I mean pitch black. It's very difficult to be in darkness here in London because of all the sort of external light noise, isn't there? And uh, even curtains aren't that thick. But have you ever been out there in the countryside, maybe in your home country or somewhere where uh, you're out in the dark and it's thick darkness? I remember I used to live in the Yorkshire Dales and I remember some nights that uh, we would go to church or there would be pie and peas in the village hall and um, we would do a journey all the way back to our house and uh, it was pitch black. I mean, it was so pitch black that it was, it was frightening. You know, you couldn't even see your hand in front of you. And thank God you had torches, but your kids, you don't want torches. You just want to see if you can make it back without a torch. And so that thick darkness, you know, without a torch, there would be nothing to do but just sit down. 
Because otherwise what's going to happen is you're going to fall over, you're going to bang into a wall, some Yorkshire cow is going to spear you with its horn or something like that. Who knows what's going to happen? You just have to sit down and wait until it was light. Well, this is a picture of humanity who up to that point, there'd always been a remnant in the Bible, but by and large, up to that point, humanity had been sitting in darkness. Oh, they'd been living their lives, but when it came to living their lives according to the plan of the Creator, they were in utter darkness. They couldn't see anything. Uh, they didn't know which way to walk. It, it was just an era of total darkness, spiritual darkness, the darkness of sin that blinds the understanding of all human beings. And so this picture of the people sitting in darkness, because they can't do anything else, they're helpless. Seeing a great light, imagine that. Imagine being blind and seeing light for the first time and being able to see the world around you for the first time. Jesus healed the man who was born blind. Can you imagine what it must be like to have no concept of sight all your life and then suddenly your eyes are open? It must have been the most incredible revelation of a new world. Well, here, spiritually speaking, these people opened their eyes for the first time and what opened their eyes was the ministry of Jesus. John's Gospel says that Jesus revealed himself and said, I am the light of the world. He illuminates darkness. He shows us the path like a torch. He shines into our minds and by his word, he shows us what's correct and what's incorrect in our thinking. He enlightens us. He delivers us from the land and shadow of death. Now, going back to Isaiah chapter 9, this is what was going to happen to the people in that time. Um, and it speaks about the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You will multiply the nation, you'll increase their gladness, and they will be glad in your presence. So when God moves in Holy Spirit power, when God turns up and shows his face, when Jesus, God made man, commences his ministry, these are the things that are going to happen. Light is going to shine in dark uh, hearts. There's going to be a multiplication of the kingdom of God. Multiplication, miracles that we remember like the bread and the fish. All these things God is going to bless. When God blesses, things multiply, don't they? It's the order of Genesis. He said, let there be fish and let them multiply. Let there be birds and let them multiply. Uh, Ad Adam and Eve go into the world and multiply. When God moves and a new dawn comes into people's lives or a nation's life, then multiplication comes because blessing comes. Gladness is increased because people feel the presence of God breaking through into their lives like they hadn't for at least a very long time. The harvest is glad, it says, and there is a, a breaking of yokes that are containing us and holding us back. As men rejoice when they dis divide the spoil, for you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor as at the battle of Midian. What was the battle of Midian? That was Gideon. Do you remember Gideon? And he was the least of the least of the least. And God said, I'm going to use you to do a mighty deliverance. And Gideon said, there's no way. I'm the least of the least of the least. And God said, that's why I'm using you. So that nobody can think it's a human breakthrough, but only God that did it. And then he called all of Israel to go out and to, to destroy the Midianites. And then God whittled it down, didn't he? He said, look, if they don't want to come, they don't have to. Half of them left. Look, if they're frightened, I mean, who wouldn't be frightened about a battle? If they're frightened, they don't have to come and a whole bunch of them left. And then, it, then God got weird and said, look, if they, if they kneel and put their mouth in the water to drink, then they can go home too. Only those that cup can stay. And by the end of it, Gideon's like, I've got 300 men. And, and, and God says, it's because if I didn't allow you to become so weak, and, and unable in your own strength, if I didn't allow that to happen, the process 
of you feeling weak, of you feeling incapable to do what God has called you to do or, 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 to, or, to, or, or to be a disciple, when you feel that incapability to do what God has called you to do and you, you feel like Gideon, that's exactly where God wants you for the new move, for a new dawn. Because then no one will glory in anybody but God. And you won't get it into your mind that you're the one that did it. God may have helped a little bit, but you're the one that did it. And, and what did they do? How did they scatter the Midianites? You remember the story? They had these lights in clay vessels, didn't they? And at the right moment when the trumpets sound, they smashed the, uh, the clay vessels and there was a sudden burst of light. All around the camp, light came. And the enemy was so confused it was driven off. Why is Isaiah talking about this? Matthew's thinking about this. Because Matthew's saying, you know what? When Jesus started preaching the gospel, it was like light began to shine. Demons began to cry out. They didn't know what was going on. Uh, they, they couldn't cope with the manifestation of God term, turning up. People were getting healed, but even more importantly, people were turning to God. And it was God's victory, nobody else's. We also see that the reason Isaiah says that there's going to be a breakthrough in Israel at this time, he says there's a cause. All of this, uh, it, it, it says that every boot of the booted warrior in the battle turmoil and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. It's the picture of the battlefield and the children of Israel are turning up at the battlefield and the battle's already been won before they got there. And, and why is this happening? Why is God himself going to do the mighty deliverance? His people have waited for him, but God is the mighty deliverer. And, we, we, and, and when he moves and a new dawn comes into our lives, we're going to be astonished. Because we'll know it's not us pretending it was God. You ever wondered whether a preacher or a ministry or a church or a Christian TV program was maybe pretending a little bit more about what God was actually doing in them and through them. There's a tendency among Christians for testimonies to sort of like get bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, like the man who ca caught a fish and it was this size. But by the time he got to the pub, it was so big he couldn't carry it back. And, and, and there's a tendency for people to try and shore up God. Try and make God, God you know, God's not doing really what he should be doing so... Um, uh, we'll amplify it. We'll, we'll make it sound better. We'll put a spin on it. You never have to put a spin on God. If you ever have a temptation to spin something that God has done for you to make it more sensational, stop it immediately. Because when, when, when God does what God does, God does what God does, and he doesn't need you to, uh, to, to make it into something that it wasn't. But what was this cause? Well, here it is in verse 6. For a child will be born to us. The cause of this new dawn was a child being born. Now, this was a prophetic child at the time that carried a prophetic name uh, that, that brought it. But this was a type of the fact that when Jesus was born, all this that was promised was now guaranteed by his birth. When Jesus was born, it was set in motion. There was nothing that the devil could do about it. He could watch. The boy would grow into maturity 30 years. But God had set a new dawn in motion. And when Jesus started his ministry and proclaimed the kingdom of God is at hand, a new dawn had broken through. I don't know about you, but I don't really want a new year. Are you excited about the new year? Well, thank God for his faithfulness in last year and thank God for his faithfulness in the year before, but I don't really want a new year like last year or the year before, the year before that or the last 10, 15 years. I, I, I don't really want a new year. I really would like a new era. That's what I'd like to enter into. Maybe that's a silly thing to say, but that's how I feel. I'd like a new era, a new dawning to come into all of our lives. I'd like to think that the pain that some of us have been through and the disappointment and the struggles over the years are all about preparing us for a new dawn and a new era and a new move of the Holy Spirit. 
where because we've been through the disappointments, we'll be all the more grateful for the move of God. Over the years at Kensington Temple, we've been associated with many moves of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and I've been involved in them because I've been here for like 28 years or so. And I can honestly say that I never wanted a, a new era of the Holy Spirit more than I want now. And in those early days, some of the moves of the Holy Spirit, I was grateful, but I don't think I really appreciated it. Like perhaps I definitely would appreciate a move of God now. I'm not saying God's not working amongst us. Of course he is. I'm talking about a new move, a new era that we've been hearing of. Read your revival times. We're believing God, that God's going to do something new, not just a new year, but perhaps a new era for you and I. Uh, uh, let's believe God. That, that if we feel that at times he hasn't come through with all his glory, let's not give up. Let's not face difficulties with disappointment in God, but let's face difficulties with the promises of God, with the character of God. It's hard, I know. The disappointments hit you and, and you think, God, where are you? But then when you read the Bible or you hear a decent sermon, then something inside you, hope arises a little bit because you're thinking, wait a second, this isn't the end of it. There's more to come. God has a plan and a purpose even when we don't see it. God works in kairos times. He comes, he moves in eras at the right time he sent his son, not at the wrong time. They'd have liked him earlier, thousands of years earlier. At the right time, God brings in a new era. And when he brings in a new era, he begins a work in people's lives which prepares them, but also makes them desire this new move where God will be glorified, lives will be changed, people will be saved. Yes, miracles will come, but that won't be the focus. God will be the focus. And ordinary people, ordinary people begin to turn to God and come out of sitting in darkness and begin to run in the light and begin to see themselves and their families and their circumstances and their situations not in the darkness of satanic sin, but begin to see it in the covenant of God and the blessing of God and the purposes of God. God has a plan for your life. And he's not giving up on you. If you give up on him, he will not give up on you. He'll just wait until you come round again. And he's got a way of sending his Holy Spirit round the back to bring you out the front again. God is wanting to do special things in our lives. Let's rise up and believe him in the coming days. And this Christmas, let, let, let us dare to believe that next year is not just a new year. But let's ponder and think as Mary did when she realised that a new era had come with her son. Let us think, what would a new era look in our lives? If God did something special in your life, what would it look like? If God moved in your heart in a special way, how would it affect you? Let's be excited. Let's be expectant. Let's pray. This is, this is nothing we can force. This is nothing we can hype up. If we do, uh, it'll work against God. But it's something that you can take that little flame that's in you, however small it may be, and I think some of you have got some big flames here tonight, that little flame of God, you know it'll never be extinguished in your life, do you know that? The flame of God in your life, if you believe Jesus is the saviour, there's a flame in your heart, no matter what happens, it will never be extinguished. God will never extinguish eternal life in your heart, no matter how hard you try and batter it. But whatever size that flame is, let's take it, let's tent it, let's put fuel on it, Let's ask the Holy Spirit to show us environments and places and things that we can do so that those flames that are in us in the new era perhaps become all-consuming flames.